Hello and welcome to our second exercise on reinforcement learning. My name is Max Schenke and today we will be speaking about Markov chains. The first task is to define the state transition probability matrix for the given Markov chain as defined by this diagram. An order of the states is already given as of here. We predefined it in beforehand, so the task is rather straightforward and the solution can be seen here. The rows tell me from which state I come and the columns tell me to which state I go. For example, if I have a look at row 2, column 3, this is 0.4, and which uh, transition is this? It's the state 2, so it's me trends, this is where I start, and state 3 is the pizza state. So it's the transition from me trends to pizza, which is 0.4, so 0.4 is correct. Let's have a look at another one. For example, state 5, the last beer, there's only one transition that I could take from here on and it goes to state sleep. So I am in row 5 and the only element that is visible here is the one in column 6. Now that we've defined the transition probability matrix, we can have a look at the stationary state of the Markov chain. For every time step k, there is a probability given that we are in one of the specific states. And now if we let k go to the infinite, uh, we still need to have some probability to be in one of the states or in one distribution of states. If a stationary state exists, this probability vector will not change if the transition probability matrix is applied to it. So this equation must hold and we can make use of this to find the stationary state. Then we can simply plug in the identity matrix I6 here and the transition probability matrix that we defined in the previous task and then have a look at the uh, equation system that we have to solve. And please keep in mind that this is the left eigenvector of this problem, not the right eigenvector that we are used to deal with. It's the left eigenvector and therefore we have, don't have to look uh, at the rows but at the columns of the matrix. Yeah, and if we have a look at the first column of the matrix, we see that only the first element is defined and all the other elements are zero. So we can directly see from this that P1 times 1 has to equal zero. So in other words, P1 has to equal zero to solve this equation. Keeping this in mind, we can now have a look at column 2 of this matrix. Um, so what do we see? Minus 0 0.6 times the P1 element plus 1 times the p2 element has to equal 0 as well. So we can, um, as we already know that p1 has to be 0, uh, we now see that p2 also has to be 0. And following this recipe, uh, we see that all the elements from p1 to p5 have to be 0. p6, however, we don't gain any information about p6 because the sixth row of the matrix is 0, so there are no information about p6 included here. However, the sum of elements in the probability vector has to be equal to 1. We have to be somewhere in uh, any point in time, uh, so we can't be nowhere. And using this information, we can calculate um, what P6 will be, because the sum over all P will be equal to 1, and P1 to P5 will be 0, so there's only P6 left to be equal to 1. Now the question is, why is P6 equal to 1? Let's have another look at the chain diagram. And we see that state number 6 is the sleeping state. So any nights out that follows this diagram will end in going to sleep eventually. Which means that we will stay in the sleeping state. Uh, and so this has to be the stationary state in the end. And that's why the probability of the sleeping state has to be equal to 1 for the stationary. Now let's have a look at task number three. We are now redefining the Markov chain as a Markov reward process. So now there are rewards handed out for each of the states. Making use of this reward vector, we can make use of the Bellman equation to define the value function of this Markov reward process. And now we want to calculate this value function. The first step to calculate the value function is to simply isolate the value function on one side of the equation. Then we need to plug in all the knowledge that we have about the system on the other side. As we don't want to calculate this by hand, and um, especially we don't want to 
invert this matrix by hand, we will make use of Python to calculate it for us. So what do we see here? We have the state transition probability matrix that we already defined um, in the first task. We have the reward vector that we already uh, defined here. Um, we have to make it into a column vector for easier uh, calculation and then we simply can um, calculate what it says here in the equation. Here I6 is the 6 cross 6 identity matrix. Linalk inf is the inversion of this matrix and matmul simply stands for matrix multiplication. And then we can print the value function that we are interested in. But we also need to talk about the discount factor gamma. At first we will set it to 0 0.9. So what does this mean? The discount factor does not tell us how far into the future we will be looking. We are always looking into the future infinitely as long as gamma is uh, greater than 0. But if gamma is uh, bigger, uh, this means that the emphasis on the future is higher. So a value of 0 0.9 means that we are um, we pay more attention to what will happen in the future than um, as it would be uh, like if we would uh, set gamma to 0 0.1, for example. So we now take on a far-sighted perspective and I will run the program and we will see the values that result here. And we see that the value of the first state, the value of the initial beer, has the highest value here. Uh, and the value of the state um, of the last beer is the lowest. So why is that? It's because the chance to accumulate um, high rewards or accum accumulate positive rewards at least is rather high when you start uh, the night out. So if you start with the initial beer there's a good chance that you will receive um, high rewards. If we change gamma to 0 0.1 now for example we will take a more short-sighted um, perspective. So we are paying more attention to the immediate reward and not so much attention to the future reward. And if I run the program now, we will see that the val values change here. And now the, um, the state that has the highest value is state number three, uh, which is the pizza, pizza state. So why is that? Um, of course, uh, the value is now mostly defined by the immediate reward that we get in the state. And the pizza state, state number three, has the um, highest immediate reward of, uh, I think, plus two. And so uh, it's plausible that we get the highest um, value for the state now with uh, a short-sighted discount factor. That's all about Markov chains uh, for the moment. Now we will be going to task number four and we'll be looking about Markov decision problems. In this Markov decision problem, you always have to choose between two possible actions. You can either be productive or you can be lazy. And uh, whatever action you will take, this will end up in a different stochastic um, event. So if you are in the hangover state and you want to be productive, you end up in this node. And here you have a chance of 0 0.3 to visit the lecture. So being productive is maybe successful with a chance of 0 0.3. But um, if you are not lucky this day, um, there's a chance of 0 0.7 that you end up being still hungover and are not going to the lecture. So in the end, for this problem or this class of problems, we can define multiple uh, straight state transition probability matrices, one for um, each action and so in this case we can define two of them. So one transition probability for being lazy and one transition probability for being productive and this is the first task. It's not really that different um, from doing it for Markov chains uh, where we do not have the choice between um, multiple actions. We this time only have to co um, consider uh, which action is actually taken. And here is the solution. We can also define um, value function for this task as well um, and this will be done in task number five. In order to evaluate the problem we also need to define a reward vector. The reward vector is given here and we see that all the states other than the terminal state are rewarded by minus one. So what does this mean? Uh, how can we interpret this rewards? It is not really um, based on the state that we are in, which reward we get here, but it's rather uh, a time cost that we reward here. So for every time step that we need in order to um, finish the problem, um, 
it, it gets worse and worse and our re reward gets lower and lower. So we are encouraged to finish the problem as fast as we can and end by passing the exam as fast as possible. But generally speaking, the task is not so different uh, from task three. We still need to, uh, to calculate some evaluation, but we need to calculate it twice because there are two actions that we could possibly take. So we need one evaluation for being lazy and one evaluation for being productive. Um, the code is nearly the same. Um, we only need to do it twice, which is done within this loop. We then see the two results given here. First, the evaluation for being lazy, and we see that most of the states get a um, get a value of minus 10. So why is that? Let's have a look. As we see here, uh, most of the being lazy transitions will get us to end up in being the more sleep state. And the more sleep state cannot be left uh, as long as we are lazy. So we will be sitting here in the state infinitely, but um, we are not paying attention to the infinite reward because the discount factor is not um, equal to 1, but, but it was equal to um, 0 0.9 as given here. And so the um, accumulated reward will not diverge, but uh, will be um, kept by minus 10. For being productive, the evaluation gets better. Of course, the values are still in the negative because we are still losing time, but uh, this time um, we are actively working towards um, terminating the problem and um, yeah, passing the exam and yeah, en ending the cycle. So the, it, it's plausible that the values are better in this case. Then we ask a little bonus question here, um, which asks uh, how we can evaluate the value of the more sleep state as long as we are using the lazy policy. As long as we are using the lazy policy, we are transitioning from more sleep to more sleep. So we are staying here and um, keep on losing time. Um, and yeah, how we, can we calculate the value of the state now? It's uh, simple by making use of the uh, geometric series. The reward of losing time or losing time during one time step is given by minus one. And so we can uh, simply plug in the discount factor of 0 0.9 into this um, geometric series. And this is, um, allows us to easily calculate the um, uh, value of the state. And as we see, the value is in fact minus 10. But um, yeah, there is a little numeric inconsistency due to the um, calculation. Now let's have a look at task number six, action value function evaluation. Uh, now we will be dealing with a stochastic pol policy. In task number five, we had a deterministic policy, so we were sticking to either being productive or being lazy. And now there is a chance, chance of alpha that we will be productive and a chance of one minus alpha that we will be lazy. For this task, alpha will be defined as 0.5, uh, and hence we will call it a 50-50 policy. Um, half of the time we'll be uh, productive and half of the time we will be lazy. The action value function is defined by another Bellman equation as given here. And we now want to um, calculate um, which action value each state action pair will have as long as we are following this 50-50 policy. So how does the code for this example look like? First, uh, we are defining everything that we already know. And then we are calculating the mean transition probability. As we know, we are uh, we have a probability of alpha to be productive and a probability of one minus alpha to be lazy. So, in uh, on average, um, yeah, this mean probability or this mean transition probability will come out. Then we have um, the already defined re reward array or reward vector, and um, we already know how to um, calculate the value function. Um, as we see, the value function uh, plays a role here in this action value function. So in order to calculate the action value, we also need to calculate the value first. And as it says, value with index um, pi, so the value with, uh, under this policy, we also need to uh, um, we also need to consider that this policy um, uh, follows um, this transition probability then. Yeah, and then um, this is uh, rather straightforward. We only need to implement this formula here in the code. The states already have an order. 
um, but we also need to give an order to the actions. So we will say that index 0 um, will equal being lazy and index 1 will equal being productive. And then we can easily uh, plug in all the knowledge that we have and um, calculate the action values. The result is then given uh, by this matrix that contains all the action values. One action value for every state action pair uh, that this uh, problem um, allows or that this problem defines. And we see that all the values are a little bit better than um, if uh, we were simply being um, lazy. So they are not minus 10, but a little bit better, but they're also not um, as good as they were uh, if we were productive all the time. Now, how do we read this matrix? The rows are uh, given by the states. So the first state um, is in the first row, which would mean um, in this um, case, the hangover state. Um, and it also has the lowest um, the value here, as we can see. Um, and yeah, as we defined, um, the zero index means uh, we are going to be lazy now. And the one index means we are going to be productive now. So in this case, we would have been lazy immediately and afterwards we would be um, expected to be following the 50-50 policy. And in that case, we would have been productive immediately and afterwards also follow the 50-50 um, policy. So let's now have a look at task number seven, which is the last task for this exercise, where we'll be um, having a look at uh, the influence of the alpha parameter. So what we will do here, we will evaluate the state values of our um, problem for different values of alpha for this stochastic policy. So at first, we need to define the alphas that we want to look at. I did this uh, in this case by placing 1000 uh, samples in between 0 and 1, so 1000 um, different alphas uh, in the value range between 0 and 1 are examined. And then I simply automized calculating the value function for all the different alphas. The question just asks us to calculate the values for the states lecture and study, um, but the um, other state values are also calculated here. So after calculating the state values, we can plot them um, independence from um, alpha, and the result is this diagram where we see how the state value is um, differing um, with change of alpha. Most interesting for this are now the dashed lines, which is the red dashed line for visit lecture and the blue dashed line for study. And yeah, what does it tell us now? For high alpha, we are rather productive. And for high alpha, um, studying gives us a higher chance of passing the exam than um, visiting the lecture. And for low alpha, we are rather lazy. And for being lazy, passing the exam is easier when visiting only the lecture and not studying. So why is that and why is there a break-even point over here? Let's have another look at the Markov decision process diagram. Where is it? There. And here we see that when we are visiting the lecture, there is a chance when being lazy that we will pass the exam. And that's good for us. But if we are um, unlucky and uh, we go to the study state, and we are still being lazy, then there's a high chance that we just end up at getting more sleep and staying here. So once we are failing the, the exam here um, from this um, point, we are, um, have a high chance to go into this uh, cycle and this is um, rather bad for us. And if we are productive uh, and we start here, then we need another, um, yeah, it, it costs more time to go um, from the lecture to the uh, to studying and then to pass the exam then um, if we would be just studying and uh, directly go to the exam of course there's also a chance to um, miss but the chance is very low and uh, so it's not very significant so what can we conclude if we are rather lazy it's better to visit the lecture because this gets us a higher chance of passing the exam and not um, stepping into the cycle of just sleeping, um, although we should be studying. And if we are rather productive, we maybe don't even need to um, visit the lecture because uh, just studying um, is good enough to pass the exam.
So in the end, if you want to be lazy, want to be very lazy and still pass the exam, your chances are highest if you are uh, visiting the lecture. Okay, that's it for today. Um, thank you for listening. Um, take care. Cheers.